Good morning. Good seeing each of you here this morning. A lot of people traveling on vacation. So if there's any first time visitors, you'll notice on our bulletin there's an extra flap. That's our visitor's card. We'd appreciate it if you'd fill it out. Take that off, put it in the offering plate that comes around, have a regular visit this morning. Uh, again, remind you that we're on YouTube, both live streaming and, of course, is to uh, be posted. So uh, that gives us a present on the digital world. Remind you, we're still doing soccer with the Savior on uh, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And adult Bible study will continue. Uh, it says those who are, and we're going to give, Kate and bring up in a second here, those who uh, you will be stuffing totes for the back to school bash. We'll be doing it next Sunday after the service. There'll be lunch and uh, provide stuff like that. Maybe, maybe uh, Kate will say a little bit more about that. Then the back to school bash will be on Saturday, August the 7th. There's a container uh, in the foyer for your contributions for uh, pens and pencils and crayons and those type of things. There'll be a meeting of the worship team on Sunday after the service on August the 22nd. Um, <clears throat> our missions update today, we got two of them. One is a report from uh, American Center for Law and Justice, which is, of course, is Jay Seculo's group. Uh, the Sixth uh, Circuit uh, upheld an Ohio law, nine to seven, that prohibits women from obtaining an abortion due to the discovery that the baby has Down syndrome. And so in other words, that was a win for the pro-life people. Although 9-7 is an awful close vote, so I don't know if they're gonna appeal that to the Supreme Court or not. <clears throat> also, a health center required all social workers and healthcare workers to sign an agreement stating that each worker would, must provide abortion information to all pregnant clients. Since Christian workers could not sign the document, they faced dismissal. ACLJ sent a letter to the facility's HR director stating that the requirement violated the civil rights of their employees. After consulting the facil facility's lawyers, the center agreed and removed the requirement. That's a positive thing. And finally, the Supreme Court has ruled in an eight to one decision that college students may witness and distribute literature throughout the college grounds, not just areas designated by the college. So you've got three victories. There's a lot of battles out there. There's three victories there. <clears throat> now from Daniel and Miriam Liebrich in Belgium, if you've been paying attention to some of the world news, it's a fact there's been a lot of rain and floods out there and Belgium is not spared. Way Belgium is where the Libriks live have suffered the same devastating floods as much as Europe. Not much damage has been done to Daniel's property, but his neighbor has an underground garage, as several people do when you drive down into the garage, where his new car, his motorcycle, his furnace, his washer and dryer have all been ruined by the flood. And apparently there's been a number of people who've had that problem. Uh, also, Daniel <coughs> extended an electric cord to his neighbor's house and then uh, helped an elderly man turn off his power to his house when they saw the smoke coming out of the basement. <laughs> the hospital where Daniel serves as a chaplain and where Daniel's mother and Marion's father are flooded in their basement. Unfortunately, the hospital computers and phone lines are located in the basement. <laughs> Uh, Victor's operation, Victor, of course, is Marion's father, uh, was scheduled late in the morning, but they moved the operation up to 8 a.m. The surgeons were able to put a pin in Victor's femur to repair the bone. The operation was successful, but by 11 a.m. the hospital was placed on lockdown and all surgeries for the rest of the day were canceled. Downtown Way uh, was flooded as the Hoax River uh, overflowed its banks. More rain has fallen in that 48 hour period of time than has happened in the last 200 years. Daniel's thankful that the church building was largely spared, but other sister churches, particularly down river cities, 
were not so blessed. And uh, Pempinster, for example, several people lost their lives. Many lost all their belongings and as water covered up up to the second floor uh, windows. And so, <clears throat> and buildings. And I World Missions will be used in some of their special Belgium COVID relief fund to help flood victims through the end of August. On a personal note, Marion's mom, Marie, is now experiencing serious anxiety attacks. Of course, her husband's in the hospital. Now he got the floods. It is difficult for Daniel and Miriam to enjoy a few days vacation time that they had off while all this is going on. So there's your update from uh, Belgium. You ready, Mike? Good morning. The reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 30. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from self amb selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then, only in, that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you, with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you a salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here, to be, now here is in me. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this day you've given us the time together here this morning to meet uh, fellowship and learn from your word. Thank you for the time in the Sunday school hour here this morning, uh, the lessons we can uh, take here from the life of Absalom. And Father, I pray that you continue to be here in the morning service to guide and direct Pastor Lowther as he brings forth thy word this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We continue our study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, or chapter 2 actually. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first 12 verses that we're going to look at continues in very much the same vein as chapter 1. There's three things Paul always tried to do when he entered into a new field. Remember before Paul got there, he didn't hear the gospel, right? I mean, this is, a, this is the initial time, right? This is the first time. And so, first of all, he has to get them to be confident who he is, right? That he is he's someone who's genuine and some telling the truth. Secondly, he has to give the evidence of the gospel, right? And so, the evidence of the gospel is say, listen, I'm going to show you many proofs of why what I'm telling you is true, right? The third thing, he wants a bond with them. He wants, there has to be this sort of personal connection. There has to be the fact that, you know, trust is only built when there is this confidence, right, in this relationship. Well, he only had three weeks. And you might think, well, th three weeks is a pretty good time. No, actually they're working, right, they're doing other things, so he's not being able to converse with him for three weeks. As a matter of fact, as we're going to see in this passage, not only 
was he teaching them, but he also was working so that he might support his own group. <laughs> Paul's a busy guy. And so there's, there's two things that he greatly regrets. Number one, that he's ushered out of town long before he need, wanted to be because he's trying to teach him. The second thing he regrets is the Jews are coming after he is kicked out and trying to undo everything he did. And so the gospel is never seen without opposition, right? There's always those who oppose. And so Paul is really wrestling with this, and the Jews who had, who had actually caused the fuss in Philippi are now coming causing the fuss in Thessalonica and causing the fuss in Berea. And uh, so he's being chased down, literally down south through Greece by all this opposition. Uh, as I mentioned last week, one of the things that is a positive thing here is the fact that since he didn't finish what he's going to say, he writes these letters. Now we have them. <laughs> and we can see what needed to be said. So we pick it up here at chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much affliction. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased uh, to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for our laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. Amen. Notice how the personal right push he has here, the really uh, identification. See, Paul was forced to leave the Thessalonians before he could fully disciple them, before he could fully defend his ministry and his teaching and, and fully bond with them. Um, he felt that his ministry was short-circuited. Now, we know that God providentially uh, directs things. And quite often we have a plan, but God has a different plan, right? And quite often we want to accomplish this, this, and this, but God has something totally different. Quite often we feel that it's not complete. I remember when our first son you know, left, I thought, well, there's other things we've got to deal with here. <laughs> you, know, you never get to the point of saying, okay, everything's done, right? Everything's completed. And so we come here that Paul felt that somehow it was short-circuited what was done. So, so the Jews tried, not only did they stir up trouble, they tried to discredit everything Paul said in the gospel. As a matter of fact, we find out from last year, week from that passage, they were jealous. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Pilate found out when Jesus was brought before him. He says he knew the priest did because of jealousy. Because they were jealous of Jesus. He was getting a a gathering. He was, people were listening to him, and they were jealous of him. 
By the way, there's been a lot of evil done in the name of jealousy, hasn't there? An awful lot of evil. And so, uh, so here, so the Jews tried to discredit him, and since Paul was no longer with them, he sent two letters back to them to defend his authority, to defend his teaching, and also to express his genuine concern for them. And so this was the, the, the impetus for these letters. Now God had entrusted the gospel to Paul who had not failed in his calling. He said, listen, I have passed the test of authenticity. I have not shirked my responsibility. You know, we have a saying in the athletic world, he left it all on the court. <laughs> but Paul said, I, I left it all there. I gave my total self. Paul could not look back and think of something he was missing, right? He, he, he just gave it all. He told them all. He showed his sincerity. He said, listen, everything that I had done, I had done for your benefit and for the furtherance of the gospel. So he said, I passed the test. And so when Paul was with them, he behaved. He said, when I was there, I was very devoutly. You could see my religious unction. You could see the fact that what I preach, I also practiced. I, 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 I acted justly amongst you. I was blameless in everything I had done. And I acted purely. And by, by the way, the word purely here is the issue is the fact what you see is what you got. I, I had no hidden deceit, right? I, there was nothing I was trying to do for gain. I was doing everything up front, and what you heard me say was exactly what I meant and exactly the way I lived. So Paul was acutely aware of his reputation and testimony. And by the way, that's important. All the time we have to be aware of our testimony and aware of you know, the way we come across to people. And uh, that doesn't mean that we're weak, right? Sometimes you have to be strong. But it means the fact that your, your motivation is honest, your motivation is from the Scripture, your motivation is pure. And that's what Paul said. He was pure. Because if you notice later on this passage, we're going to get to that, it, not only did he nurture them, but he said, also admonish you. You know, at, at times I admonish you. So both have to be there, right? So Paul said, I did this out of a pure heart. So he said, now listen, not only did I come with you with purity, but I came, I supported myself and all those who were with me preaching to you and working night and day so that I would not be a burden to them. Now there's, there's three things we want to note here. Of course, Paul is a leather maker. Now your scriptures might say uh, tent maker, but the word there is the word for leather. <laughs> So he probably not only made tents, but he made, you know, belts and sandals and, you know, he, he, was, a, he was a traveling leather store right there, you know. And so he would do, and that's very time intensive, isn't it, you know, to do that. So here, this guy's preaching and also working, not, he said, not only did I support myself, but I supported those who were with me. And so Paul was working very diligently. So he, he, he made money for the group. Now, Paul said, listen, the, the second thing we notice, I didn't impose myself on you. I mean, we know that the Thessalonians was a poor church, as mentioned over in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, I didn't come saying, you know, it would have been nice if you would have brought me to your home and you would have fed us and, 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 and taken care of us. He said, I didn't, ask, I didn't ask for any of that. I didn't impose myself. I didn't want anybody to think that I was here to get money out of you. You know, I don't want, didn't want anyone to think that I had an ulterior motive. And so that's the third thing we notice. In fact, he says, I don't want anyone to misconstrue that I was here for some kind of gain. Now, listen, he says, as an apostle, I could have asked for that. Now, I want to make a contrast between this and the Corinthians. He was with the Thessalonians for three weeks, but he was with the Corinthians for 18 months. He says, I didn't impose myself in, but the Corinthians was a fairly, fairly wealthy church compared to Thessalonians. He says, you could have, you know, if I'm going to give you spiritual food, you could at least give me what? <laughs> Some physical food, right? You could have at least done that. He said, I didn't even take a, a, a shoe latchet from any of you. He says, I didn't impose myself. As an apostle, I could have, right? As an apostle, I could have said, listen, I am 
one of God's representatives. I've been called to this. So when we have missionaries come in, we have a mission conference this fall. Those missionaries should rightly expect God's people to support them, right, as they're given the gospel. They should be supported from God's own people. And so Paul said, I didn't demand that from you. So I came, I ministered, I worked my hands so all those people who were with me could be supported, and I didn't ask anything from you in return. And so now Paul states that he had given them the authentic gospel, he had shown he had shown exactly the proof of what he was saying, and he, now he said, I want you to understand there are many false teachers out there. Uh, in the book of Second Peter, uh, the, the book of Jude, all those are dealing with these false teachers. He says, and those Jews coming after me are false teachers. I gave you the pure God. There's a lot of false teachers out And a lot of false teaching, he says, I show you the exact evidence how you can check out those things. And he said, that's why in the 17th chapter, verse 11 of Acts, it says that the Bereans were more noble even than the Thessalonians because they checked it out. Paul would say, and Isaiah says, say, wait a minute, let me look it up. And they, they would look it up. They checked it out. And by the way, one of the greatest guards against your faith is you check it out, right? It's you find out. Don't just listen to someone. You find out if from the Scriptures that's exactly what it says. And so Paul, he said, I gave ample and proof, many infallible proofs for the validity of my message. Now, this is something I want to zero in as the heart of this message. He gives three motivations of false teachers. And he said, I'm not any of these. I want you to notice this. Notice, see the three he mentions there. Number one, some preach out of error. Uh, some really believe their message, but it's wrong. <laughs> some, some are teaching, but they really believe this because this is the way they were taught, and this is what they, they taught. But they really believe it, but they're not right. <laughs> You know, so they're teaching error without even knowing, and, and so they're honestly doing this, and so they're teaching this error even though they don't know it's an error. And many in the, the, the culture are that way. You have a Joseph Witness come to, they really believe what they believe, but they can't have any evidence for what they believe, and once you get them off onto that, they say, oh, well, it's time for me to leave. I say, oh, I guess it is, because they've been indoctrinated, right? <laughs> And so they embrace the false message, and many people are going to go to uh, hell because they embrace the false message, right? And uh, people ask me about that. I said, well, that's why you were taught. I said, what's going to happen? They're going to stand for the Lord says, did you have a copy of my word? Right? Did you check it out for yourself? You know, I... You know, wife witnessing to her friend, you know, said, well, this is what they tell me. Well, I don't care what they tell you. <laughs> the Word of God is what is the standard, right? It's not what someone tells you. Okay? And so Paul said, I didn't come with flattering words. I didn't come with error. You know, I came teaching you the truth. You know, we quite often accept that which we don't even check out to see if it's true or not. By the way, that's one of the huge mistakes in college. It's in fact, these uh, kids come there and to, they, they take on and take on and take on. Without even checking it out, they say the most ludicrous things. And he said, well, he has a PhD behind us. I remember one of the first history courses I took, the, 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 and, and I'm glad he did this. The professor gave us two textbooks to read with opposite views to is to understand not everything you read and print is true, right? Or, or there are different perspectives. And, and, and so it was a good lesson. They had just the opposite points of views so on William the Conqueror, by the way, is what it was about. So the cults in, in those errant churches, they believe, and there is a lot of uh, divergent churches that teach things and have rituals and all these things that have nothing to do with the scriptures, but they sincerely believe it, don't they? And so, so first of all, I said I didn't come with error. I know what I believe, and I know why I believe it, right? By the way, those are two things that go together. Know what you believe, but also know what? why you believe it, that you can support why you believe it. Secondly, he said, I didn't come with you with uncleanness and impurity. There's a lot of religions out there to support your sin. 
in pretty religious context. As a matter of fact, Corinth had uh, 6,000 sacred prostitutes. Can you imagine sacred prostitutes? And so a message that justifies your sin, I don't, that's what, by the way, that's what the ancient cult religions were about. You know, if you take a look at Greek mythology, the gods were more evil than the men. <laughs> you know, Zeus and Apollos and Athena, all these, uh, the, fact is, the fact that they can justify themselves because you either are made after God's own image or you make your gods after your own image, and guess which one's true? <laughs> Right? And so he said, I didn't come with you with uncleanness. Uh, and by the way, the more people who follow uncleanness, the more justified the false teachers believe. One time, John MacArthur and a couple of other guys cornered Benny Hinn and, and uh, showed him all the errors. And he says, Well, look how many people follow me. <laughs> well, you know what? There's a lot of people follow Islam, and a lot of people follow Mormons. It doesn't matter how many people follow you, there's a way that seems right to the man, but what? way that in his death, that, that's immaterial. That's not the judge is how many people follow you. And so here I didn't come with uncleanness and so Paul not only touted correct doctrine, he also touted correct morality, right? To be moral. So I didn't come with you with error, uncleanness. Now here's the third one. This is the most dangerous of all. And I didn't come with you with deceit. A deceitful false teacher knows what he's teaching is false. But he does it for personal gain. So he knows he's, he's pulling the you know, wool over your eyes. He, he knows he's a flim-flam guy. He knows he's a con. There are messengers who know they're giving you a perverted message. And by the way, politicians also. But I don't have time to get off on that message. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> The fact they know it's a deceitful message, but they're seeking personal gain. As Paul said to the Corinthians, that they might make merchandise out of you. So Paul said, number one, I didn't come with error. Number two, I didn't come with impurity or uncleanness. And number three, I didn't come with deceit. Now he said, I also didn't come to glorify myself. I didn't come to get praise of men. As a matter of fact, Paul, instead of getting praise of men, was beaten and thrown in jail and, you know, and whipped and scourged and stuff like that. He says, if I'm coming to get praise of men, I'm doing it the wrong way, right? <laughs> this isn't working. <laughs> Secondly, he says, not only am I not coming to get a praise of men, but he says, I didn't come because I'm greedy, covetousness, neither glory or greed. He said, I didn't come to make wealthy. And again, he says, you know, if I come to get wealthy off of the gospel, I'm going about the wrong way. He said, now, you don't understand, being an apostle of Jesus Christ, I could have come and sort of demanded that, hey, you take care of me. He said, but I, refu I, I, cho I gave free will. I chose not to do that. I don't want anyone to say, hey, this guy's in it, so he might make money off of us. I don't want anyone to say that. You know, I've had people tell me, and uh, you know, in the past, as a witness to it, says, you know, you just want me to join your church and give you money. I said, no, you can join any church you want to. Just make sure it's a Bible teaching church. I don't care what church you join, as long as teaching the Word of God. It says, I'll get your soul. I'm concerned about. And so we got to remove that right as a motivation to the fact that you think I'm here to for my own glory or my own gain. Paul says I didn't do any of that. Now, by the way, let me, let me tell you this. This is a side note. It's a fact, the reason why Paul has to say this is because that's what he's being accused of. See, the Jews would come behind, so he's just in to make money. He's in it for his own glory. He's in it for that. They accused Jesus of the same thing, remember. All he only does this out of the power, power of the devil, right? Out of Beelzebub, you know. He said, well, a house divided, what? Shall not stand. So, so, I mean, so they accused him of all these various things. Things. And then he comes to the personal aspect here. Notice what he says here. He said, I came to you, and remember, he said, Paul said, Remember, I was chased out of 
that I was chased out of Philippi. They, they despitefully used me. They chased me out of Philippi. Uh, and not only did they chase me out of Philippi, they abused me there. He said, but there's two things I want you to notice when they did that. Number one, I didn't quit. I think a lot of us would have been discouraged a lot longer before that, right? I mean, he's being chased out of Philippi. He didn't quit. Number two, he said, not only did I not quit, but number two, he says, I was even the more bold with you. Because remember what happened, the Jews came over from Philippi to Thessalonica and started the same thing there in Thessalonica. He says, but I didn't, I didn't back down. You know, one, one of the reasons why the most believers don't witness is they're afraid of opposition. Paul said, I was even more bold, right? I was even more bold in the face of opposition. And so here, here the Apostle Paul says, listen, I came to you. I was opposed. I was attacked. There was a great uproar by the Jews. They expelled me out of Philippi. Now they expelled me out of Thessalonica. He said, what was my response to you? I preached even more boldly. <laughs> That's not the typical response, is it? He said, I stood my ground because I knew what the truth was. I knew what my calling was. He refused to be silenced. That's why Paul tells the Thessalonians, and he told the Galatians, be not weary in what? Well doing. Of course, yours will be the greater reward if you do not faint, right? And so here, the Apostle Paul says, I refuse to stand. And he said, now, and matter of fact, not did I come to you with truth, not only did I come to you with boldness, he says, I came to you like a loving parent. He says, I came, I'm, I was as gentle as a nursing mom. Uh, that's kind of an interesting image, isn't it, for the Apostle Paul. I don't know if we'd use that type of imagery today. He said, I came to you, I was, I was as gentle with you as a nursing affectionate mom. By the way, there's a, there's, a, there's a neat imagery here because they were infants in the Lord, right? And so he says, spiritually you were infants. So I came to you just like a nursing mom would. I was affectionate. And I was bonding with you. He said, not only did I give you the gospel, I gave you my own life. You know, I would have traded my life for years. I gave you my own life. I gave everything to you. Uh, you see, people are not just prospects. People are made in the image of God and are loved by God, and we're transferring that love to them, right, as we're witnessing. They're, they're not just numbers. <laughs> they're just not to be checked off. He said, I came to you because I'm concerned about you, right? I'm concerned, concerned about your soul. I'm concerned. It doesn't matter if you follow me or not. I want you to follow the Lord. It doesn't matter. And so we're not out there because we're doing a task, right? We're just checking out. We're out there because we love people. And, and, and so that's what Paul says. He says, listen, I, I've come to you at, at, with tenderness because I love you because Christ loves you. So Paul actually cared for those, you know. I think it was uh, either John Maxwell or Gary Smalley said, you know, no one cares how much you know till they know how much you care. <laughs> I think it's a good saying. Do you care? Or is this just notching your Bible, right? And so here, so Paul said, I came and I said, gentle nursing mom to be able to, to give you the gospel. Then notice what he says, he reverses the parenting here. He says, I also came as a father. I, I comforted you, I encouraged you, I exhorted you, but I also admonished you. You know, he did all that, right? I mean, one doesn't exclude the other. So he would comfort, he would nurture, encourage, but he also admonish. you need to do this. He, he, he beseeched them, he would urge them. So Paul plays a double parent role here, right? He brings to bear his nurturing, but he also brings to bear this whole concept of, of, of admonishing, and of teaching and training. 
And everything he did was out of love, he says, that in concern for you. And so to Paul, the ministry wasn't a job or a task. It was a calling of mercy and love. Just like you hear people going out on the mercy ships, you know, there's a calling of love and of compassion and, and to reach people and to help people. So that's by calling. Uh, I had a couple financial planners. Uh, when you reach the age of 65, I think they pack you up and ship you to Florida. And, uh, <laughs> and they says, you know, and they said, okay, are you going to retire? Well, no, no, you got a difference. And I try to explain the difference between a career and a calling. You know, a career is something I do as a vocation. A calling is something I'm called to do. And the Lord will tell me when it's time, right, to put it up. The Lord will tell me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks. It goes up and you just sort of go, you know, but the Lord will tell me. I mean, he'll, he'll tell me. But it's a calling. They don't understand that concept, you know. You know, or the concept that, you know, about going to put your kids in cars. Nah, they're on their own. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but the whole idea is the fact that, that Paul said, I'm called until his dying breath. You know, this is a calling. Paul wasn't thinking that, okay, you know, after a certain age, I'm going to, you know, spend my time on the Mediterranean, you know, maybe, uh, you know, on the shore. He wasn't, you know, this is my calling. Because once we cross over the threshold, that's it, right? And so whatever we've done, we've done. It's finished. So that's why, uh, Mike, I had you read from Philippians 1. He says, you know, he'd like to go home to be with the Lord, but he's, you know, between because it's more needful that I stay here with you and, and, and teach you and, and grow. And so it's not my time yet that more fruit needs to be developed, right? And so, so, so that's what Paul is saying, that he came, this is a ministry of love, there's no hidden. And one of the things that Paul had to constantly be doing is showing, you know, none of these things is because I have something hidden, right? It's not because that there's something, I, I'm, I'm trying to trick you. You know the old bait and switch, this is free until it's not, right? <laughs> you get the advertisements, oh, by the way, right? Or you, hear these, or you hear these wonderful commercials, all of a sudden the guy starts real fast at the end, very end, and you don't understand what he's saying and everything else. In other words, everything I just said was a lie. <laughs> or or that, that final word they say, oh, by some restrictions uh, apply, you know, that type of thing. You see, there's a difference then, Paul is saying, with a nominal believer and those who are infused in the love of Christ. You know, he told the Corinthians, the love of Christ just, what, compels me. It just drives me forward. The average believer doesn't, doesn't exhibit that, does he? Paul said, I just love Christ so much that I love the people that Christ loves. And I love the people that Christ loves because those are the people God the Father loves. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? And so this infusion that Paul had for him, this genuineness, this teaching, this training, this, this refusing to back down. And let me end the message by saying this. We should never back down from the truth. Whether it's the gospel truth, or whether it's political truth, or whether it's civil truth, because one of the things the enemy wants is a kowtow, right? To, to, to shut us down. You know, and I think that's what the songwriter was really thinking about when he wrote, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Because the fact that we're here for one purpose and one purpose only, to exalt our God the Father through Jesus Christ his Son. That's why we're here. And we shouldn't, as as uh, Winston Churchill said in a different context, we should never, never, never give up. We will not be silent.
because we got a mighty king who's given us a mighty calling for a mighty purpose. Amen? Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. And Lord, we know that you've given us the same type of calling that you gave the Apostle Paul and those with him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to move forward in the love and grace and mercy given to us, and being able to proclaim your word throughout this area and support missions who proclaim the word throughout the world itself. And Lord, may we not be discouraged. May we not be intimidated. May we not be silenced. That our lives would show the genuineness of what we believe. That we're ready to give an answer for the hope that lies in us. And then our love and care and concern for others will be manifested. And Lord, I pray this day, if there's anyone that comes through these doors that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they've never put their faith in Jesus Christ and never yielded to him, that this will be a day of salvation for that person. Your gracious Heavenly Father, may your spirit move in and through us for your, your glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To end this service, we'd like to give a gospel message. It's a very uh, short, uh, simple <coughs> illustration. All sin comes short of the glory of God. That's why this guy is so confused. And in his fallen state, <coughs> fallen nature, he can't go to heaven because it says in Psalm chapter 5, you can't dwell with God. <coughs> but we have eternal souls. We find in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, that the resurrection, when it comes, some to eternal life and some to eternal condemnation. And eternity lasts how long? <laughs> Forever. And so a lake of fire is made in Revelation chapter 20. And those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life are cast into the lake of fire. And the fire does not burn, neither does a worm die. But God said, Lord, the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that bridge was there, it's Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And if you never have come to faith, you might have been in church, you might have been baptized, but never been indwelt truly with the Holy Spirit because you've never come to Christ. Today would be a great day to do that. And you can glorify Jesus forever and ever. Amen.